Yes. So it's time for our last session uh, for accommodating my room remix. And um, I asked Jen to come out here mostly just because I wanted to ask her questions. And if you all are interested, in answer for it. But that's like a distant secondary interest uh, to me. So, per usual, I guess it fits with the rest of the game. Um, so, let's see, quick bio case people are not familiar, uh, which I've learned all kinds of things on Wikipedia and LinkedIn and all these, so correct me if I got any of these details wrong. Okay. Uh, but you really started in the world of video games, uh, especially working to build the Game Developers Conference in two, from like a relatively small event to a huge event, like 95 and 2003, and then from there kind of continued in this uh, event organizing, did Web 2.0 Expo, Go 2.0 Summit, Go 2.0 Expo, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. And then 2009, founded Code for America, uh, continue to be serve as executive director today. In the middle there, 2013 to 2014, took a hiatus to serve as the Deputy uh, Chief Technology Officer of the United States, and during that time worked to launch or help launch the United States Digital Service and the ETF. And people who know me think it's really funny that a Deputy Chief Technology Officer title, because I'm not technical. <laughs> well, that's what you're definitely no, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can agree for that. Yeah. Is it fair to say you're like the founding mother of civic tech? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it is. Okay. <laughs> 2009. Uh, can you tell us about like the initial conversations and, and like what led you to starting Code for America as a concept as an organization? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's really awesome. It's been a great community here. It's great to like. I, you reminded me of something I had to do. What? Rachel's leaving early. And okay. So yeah. She leaves. Let's say thank you to Rachel and Joanne. No t-shirts. No baby, we would just they'd just be another day of turn. No, we'll go to the next side. And I would still be making so well. Thanks. Thank okay. you. And you guys take such good care of me. Thank you. Yeah, so that's 2009. 2009. Um, well, so I had been um, running the Web Judo conferences and, and so Web Judo was like a thing. From 2003, it was like a new word that was, you, very few people in the world, in, in this room will remember the web 1.0, which was just like, put your ripture up on the internet. Uh, and then everything crashed and burned, and then so what you did, it was like the participatory web. So that was much cooler, and what you did, it was super fun for a while, um, like crazy growth, crazy, you know, companies growing fast, people doing interesting things, and then it got to be a little bit like every brand in the world wanted to be Web 2.0. It became very brand oriented, a little bit less interesting. And so um, then this guy started running for president named Barack Obama. And everyone was like, he's using Web 2.0 to get elected. And we were very interested in that. And what would that mean? And eventually I started going, well, that's cool, but can this, you know, the, the, the principles and values of the participatory web help him govern, which seemed like a pretty important, um, pretty important question to ask. And so that's why we started this event called Web 2.0. And so okay, like, look, how how would you how would you convene people around that idea? And I think initially people thought Web 2.0 was like the EPA will be on Twitter, yay, which was nice, but there were probably something more you know, profound that you could do with that. So it was really just out of going around and seeing how government um, does software. Uh, did it then and largely still does it that way, though it's changing now, that made me want to um, do something about it because the energy and creativity and speed and value that you could see happening in the Web 2.0 world really wasn't happening in the government world. and. There are real consequences to that. And I was sort of tuned into the consequences and saying, like, we've got we've got to figure out what to do about this. 
it's easy if you weren't involved in tech or weren't involved in politics to think that like tech's been in politics for a long time and campaigning and so forth. But I think before 2006, really there there wasn't even much like campaigning online, mm -hmm. fundraising, etc. And it was that 2006 to 2008 kind of period where it was like, wow, we can use the internet to raise some money and yeah. make phone calls and do all these things. And then after the election, and it's kind of like, we won. Okay, let's like use yeah. these skills to actually do something now other than just raising money. Right? So yeah. how, um, like, at, one of the things that's interesting to me about Copa America is uh, the statement of a nonpartisan um, mm -hmm. organization, right? And tech tends to not be nonpartisan. So when you're starting up in that environment and you say like, yeah, we want to do, uh, we want to get involved in making government work better, then we want to do it in a nonpartisan way. Were people receptive to that because it felt like all the left was in control and waiting? So it's like, yeah, yeah, nonpartisan, like all our people. Yeah. Or was it like, why were people skeptical of that? I think people are always a little skeptical of it. Um, and yes, it happened to be that, so, you know, that there were, you know, Obama brought in a bunch of ex-Googlers and, you know, was very friendly to tech industries. You know, we used to joke that he was the only president we knew what an API was. <laughs> really did. Like, we used to joke that he would make the, um, the cabinet secretaries drop and give him 20 when they didn't, when they couldn't define API. Um, but he was, you know, it was really good. So, yeah, it just so happened that we had this guy that was, um, his politics matched what a lot of tech issues, but the tech industry is not exclusively um, on one side or the other, I don't think. Um, but I think what we did really early on is instead of, so I was, got to know that I would really work with federal government, but um, my shift to starting Code for America was to move to the local level. And there's a saying, like, there's no Republican or Democratic way to pick up the garbage. And that's what, what most people do in relationship to government. I mean, you elect people, but most of your interactions, if you really think about it, aren't with the political layer, which I would say is this like, thin little surface thing um, that we pay all the attention to. Government is this sort of vast thing that does so many different tasks that actually you know, determine your quality of life in a lot of ways. Um, and most of those things really We've gotten caught up in a lot of ideas about you know um, big government or small government, um, but they're really just practical things that need to happen, and they can't be happening the same way in 2019 that they happened that they happened in 1969. They have to be different now, and when they're not, then you start to get this sort of um, dwindling spiral of loss of trust and faith in government uh, because it's not working well, and then we degrade our resources into government, and then no one wants to go into it, and then the services get worse. And I think that that, you know, we're, the idea that we need to reverse that cycle and actually see good services which make them want to go into government, which makes them want to do it well, they just want to resource it right, and actually get to this point where it's not about big or small, it's about government that runs right because we're, we're making it work, work the way it should in 2019 using, you know, digital as one of the big things, digital thinking as well as actual technology, that whole idea is very bipartisan. Like we had probably more fans among Republican members of Congress than Democratic fans, um, to be honest, um, in part because they see, you know, all of this, this, um, it's easy to look at this agenda and say it's about cutting out waste. When you know, when when IT projects are many billions of dollars, and one of your talking points is they shouldn't be many billions of dollars, then um, that's 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 very friendly to a certain you know one side of the aisle. Um, that is important to me. What drives me is not so much the cutting of the costs, but is that that is an important, necessary way to get to better outcomes. I care about like the child welfare system in California, where I live, um, you know, cutting out a bunch of the costs in creating that system was a necessary thing to do in order to create a system that does not lose kids, <laughs> doesn't, you know, place um, kids in foster care with known rapists, which is what happens when you're relying on fax machines to get information from, uh, you know, 
from law enforcement to um, a social worker. Um, we, we need that data to flow directly into that account so that kid is not placed in, a, in um, an unsafe environment. Um, and that's what matters to me more than the cost. It just happens, so happens that the cost, um, in this case, cutting the costs makes it more likely that you won't have to use a fax machine to do that. Was the fellows program, like, was that the initial pitch when you were? Yeah. In, in, for people who don't know, can you like, describe how that program works? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're kind of excited about this idea of um, you know, making government work the way it should in the 21st century. And first it was, it was all about um, you know, what the federal government can do. And then I had a friend who worked for Teach for America, or he had done Teach for America, I'm sorry, he's now he's working um, for the mayor of Tucson. And he kept saying, like, get some of your developers from your web to another world to go uh, work in Tucson local government. And it was it was just that idea, like, okay, they're not going to do that for money because they're good, they have better job offers on the table from companies and startups that they might go do it as a year of service. So yeah, the original offering was this year of service for folks with technology skills. Uh, we put them in small teams that mimic the team like the, the skills that you would see at a startup. But instead of this, you know having a startup business plan, they had to go um, work with a bunch of people in local government to solve a problem. And it was kind of magical, like all these wonderful sparks flew and people in government were excited about it. The fellows were so excited about the opportunity to see how government actually works. And they, you know, they really learned a lot from each other. Yeah, so that's how that started. Yeah, when you pitch cities in, in 2011, it's like the first fellows are getting placed, right? Yeah. So it seems like an easy pitch to be like, hey, we've got some labor to do technical stuff that you don't know how to do, and we're going to give it to you for free. Or they, they had to pay some. They had to pay some. So, yeah, sometimes philanthropists would come in and cover it, but we really wanted them to have to pay a little so that they would pay attention, and, and it really mattered, actually. Yeah. I imagine the buy-in was probably high mm -hmm. in principle, and then was it was that true when people actually hit the ground? We're like, okay, now we need things, like we need data, we need access to this. Was it, yeah, yeah we'll get you what you need, let's make this thing work? Or was it more commonly like, oh, let's simmer down, like there is a process you will go through for all these things, you know what I'm saying? Well, the, the thing is like, so government isn't like one monolithic thing. There was almost always somebody in government who had like, was the, pe the person who most wanted a, a, a fellows team, was the most excited, and was like, yes, we're gonna get you all those things. And then they would go to, you know, um, the actual IG department and, and go, we need the data and, and, and they would run into trouble, right? So you have people who are super excited and, and you know, ready to run through any wall for you. Um, and then you've got other people who are like, what? <laughs> you want what? Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Um, and our job really became, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that the technology skills that were needed were was that magic of like, yeah, but I can fix stuff and I'm gonna be your friend and you're gonna love me. And that magic was necessary in order to get through those walls. And the job wasn't at the end of the day writing programs or even like just doing some data sorting or like fixing someone's printer or trying to like do stuff like that just to make friends. The job was to get through those walls and get the data or, you know, um, sometimes it was so very, very often was you couldn't get the data, right? We had whole projects go because you couldn't get the data. Data like that was necessary to the project they had bought into. It's like, why did they bring us if they weren't going to give us the data, right? Um, but then later on, it would be like, you have this great program that you can't, or, you know. Um, does anyone hear what an ATO is? Who here has worked in government? Authority to operate? Yeah, you couldn't get the, like, the ATO. You couldn't, you, the whole thing was like ready to go, and like users could use it, but you couldn't push it live. And, so there were just walls like that that you, you end up finding a whole bunch of strategies and tactics to get around, most of which involve making friends with people and being nice. Like politics. Like <laughs> politics. I gave us a talk yesterday about Cookies and donuts really help. <laughs> yeah, wait, that is an advantage, I guess, when you're talking about city government, mm -hmm. is uh, like buying papers is not expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, a dozen donuts <laughs> is a very long way. And donuts are not illegal, as much as people will tell you everything is illegal. It's not illegal by donuts. Uh, with the first cohort or cohorts, what were your measures of success? Like, what was going to determine whether this was the thing that 
yeah. continued to go, or whether it was like, oh, that was fun, let's wrap it up and do something else? Um, I mean, we were measuring ourselves on a lot of things that, that, that ended up being the wrong things. Um, in the end of the day, it was just like, we got a couple cities to work with us our first year, and we're, uh, we're a couple other cities going to come forward. You know, that was going to determine whether we could continue to do the work. Um, but, um, you know, really, what we decided was that you're going to end up doing a lot of stuff that gets thrown away. And actually, that's true whether you work in, you know, commercial software or government or startups or whatever. Um, you will write stuff that gets thrown away. But what we needed were just a couple things that um, made everyone talk. And um, that really ended up, I mean, this is true of our strategic pillars today. We do three things. We show what's possible by making something that's so good that it just changes people's minds about what's possible in, in government. Um, and now we do that at a much greater scale than we did back in 2011, but it's the same idea. And then once you can change the conversation and have people go, oh, you can make software that's that good, um, that helps people, like really helps people, and costs that little in government, okay. Once you do that, then people want to do more of it. So our second strategic pillar is help others do it themselves. So it's just like you're creating demand and then trying to meet that demand. Um, and our third strategic pillar, which was sort of there in the beginning too, we just didn't know how to measure it, was build a movement. Like no one, this isn't going to keep going if there aren't people, you know, lots of people, whether they're in government or in you know, local community groups like our brigades or all of you who are, you know, pressuring government and offering your skills to government to say, we got to keep getting better at this. Um, and so that's, we try to sort of make that into a virtuous cycle. Um, but back then it was, it was like, is the software going to live? Like, will they actually be able to use it? And it turns out only, you know, four or five software projects a year would actually kind of live on. But that was enough to have everyone go, holy cow, we must have been doing something wrong. How do we change this new playbook? Was there any pushback or like outright attack from the Accentures and Lockheeds and Boeings who run these two hundred million dollar software projects for city governments? <laughs> um, there is a, there is pushback from them. Um, they, I, I'll be honest. I don't think that they feel um, threatened by what Code for America does very much. Um, I also think that we've shifted over time to going, how do you not just sort of push back against them, but how do you give them a path forward where they can move some of their business into the new model? Like, I have been um, really vocally, I'm sorry if there's anybody in the room, but like, I've been really um, extremely critical of Oracle. I've written horrible, nasty grams about Oracle. I'm also extremely critical of Oracle. <laughs> I call it a toxic waste dump. I think I call it un-American. <laughs> That's like a deeper bird, you know? I like that. I will connect off that now. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so like, and, and I decided that what I was going to do, so I will, we'll give, I'll get back to your question, but like, so on, on the topic of like... We'll just talk bad about Oracle the rest of our life. We can, and I also have some nice things to say about, about Deloitte, but Deloitte's also sponsoring Serves us all in, in different ways. 
Um, so we're working on government with that. I mean, I, I also serve on this defense aviation board, and so what I've been doing off and on today is rewriting these reports about software acquisition reform that the defense department's trying to do, and that's exactly in that right realm. Like the government has to change what it does. Then the companies also then have to respond differently. And I mean, it's, it's not exactly sequential, but um, it's really true that companies will, will fight these changes, right? Because they have business models that rely on, you know, billion dollar software projects that fail, um, routinely fail. Um, but what I'm trying to do is say, look, I'm going to reserve, like, I'm going to say that one company is completely irredeemable, and that's Oracle, just because I've seen the stuff that they've done. And then arbitrarily in my mind say, great, that's like the end of the spectrum, they will never know. Every other company out there has the opportunity to prove to me that they will come along with a new vision. <laughs> and government's got to do its part, but then the companies have to do their part and say, great, I see that you're making lightweight, agile, modular, um, user-centered procurements that were, you know, we can only bid on something that's a tenth of what we would have bid on, but there's still a great profit margin in it, and we should still that, do that work, and there's just gonna be 10 times of those, so we can still, like, be a big music company, and, um, and you know what, then we'll be, then all of you will actually want to work for them, because your jobs will be meaningful, and interesting, and satisfying, because you're writing software that actually works for people. So my whole thing is like everybody except Oracle gets the chance to like live up to my personal expectations of these companies, and that's probably a better way than just like putting up a wall and saying all these incredibly powerful and wealthy companies can go to hell because it's just I don't think that's gonna work. Anyway, what was your original question? <laughs>
people assume that the way that any of you would, would write software today is illegal, but it isn't. There's these layers between what the law actually says and then the practices that have accrued over time as people have interpreted that and put it into different practices that were often built for non-software processes. And so there's, you actually can do great software within the context of existing law policy and regulation as it relates to procurement. There's just an enormous amount of myth-busting and re-educating that needs to happen to do that. But that's why you see great software coming out of places like 18F and USDX in the state of California, because someone's gone through the trouble of explaining that it can be done differently. I think USDS and ATF have almost like backdoor procurement in a way where you say part of the problem in these software projects is that agile, modern firms, companies, consultancies can't afford to go through the process, can't get the right qualifications, or they yeah. can't go through a three-year spec development pitch revision cycle in order to maybe yeah. get work. They have to get work and get paid like yeah. in the short term. So the only companies that can afford it are the mega, uh, the, the large ones and the verticals and such in the world. And then they effectively have kind of a like cartel-esque control over the pricing in that market, right? And they're mutually incentivized to keep prices of, of software very high. And so it's been interesting to see over the like 10 years, kind of this two-fronted approach where some people have worked on changing procurement policies so yeah. that like projects uh, under a certain financial threshold, like under a quarter million dollars or whatever, yeah. could be bid more openly without as much qualification, could be awarded in 90 days and right. things like that. And at the same time, say, okay, let's take some of these methodologies and people and just cut the whole procurement thing out and just put them straight into government. Right. Right? And so when you started, like, how did the fellows, did, did like the fellowship mm -hmm. model lead directly to ATF and USDS? Well, you know, I think you're right that it's essentially a procurement hack to say, instead of procuring software, I'm going to procure people, and then the people can just write software with a lot fewer constraints. Yeah. Um, there's, there are still constraints, as I mentioned, like ATOs and things like that. Um, but I think there, there's a line from, you know, bring fellows in, which then also meant, you know, then from there, um, the Obama administration said, great, let's do this at the federal level, and that created the presidential innovation fellows who could kind of do the same thing. Um, but ultimately, I think the, 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 the problem with that model, it, I mean, it's fantastic, it, it won't scale. You cannot bring all of software development in-house. You will never get to where we need to go with only that. And so what you, you start to get to see that bringing things in so that you can do them quickly, um, like at 18F, and it is again just a show what's possible, get people believing that things can be different, then it aligns, you know, it's the politics, it's the culture, it's the, you know, um, you know, actually empowered public servants um, are incredibly, and empowered, excited, um, passionate public servants who actually know how the system works are an incredible tool for change. So it's just like, activate them, and then you can go get a whole bunch of other changes made. But I, I just, it's not gonna work to just bring everything in-house. So what was the conversation then when it was like, hey, let's start creating, would you call them initiatives or programs, both well, 18F and USDS? They're not agencies per se, like what's the word for them? Um, one of them is an office and the other is a, yeah, I don't remember what 18 yeah, USDS is an office within the Office of Management and Budget, yeah. And what was, what was the idea there? And yeah. was it a thing of like, oh yeah, we got the idea, like we're gonna make this happen, or do you have to go through a lot of uh, you know, approval and revision and code and so forth. It, yeah, we have like four hours to talk here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, like, um, they might leave, but like, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so how that came about <coughs> was that um, sorry, let me take a break. Um, I'm not, it's not emotional, I'm just like, I have a cough all of a sudden. Keep talking for a second. Okay. Yeah. So, presidential innovation, but I'll just clarify some of these things. Uh, 
the PIF <laughs> program started, I think, in like the 23rd, 2012 area. 2012. Uh, and so broad, where the fellows program had focused on city governments, the PIF program was like pushing into the federal space, yeah. working directly in the White House. Right. Uh, and so then had a lot of credibility, but I think something that surprises people who aren't involved in politics is the White House like, doesn't actually have much power. Right. The White House can suggest things, but yeah. it's often hard to actually make it do things. And it, it can't do procurement at all. It's not supposed to touch any procurement. I mean, it's own procurements, they can't screw with agency procurements, which is really interesting. Um, so essentially what happened was that um, Todd Park, who was the chief technology officer, the second one ever, um, wanted me to come in and run the PIF program. And um, I love the PIF program. But the day he called, I happened to be visiting the government digital service in the UK. And they were, it was like, you know, I, I'm not actually a big fan of Disneyland, but like a kid going to Disneyland. Like, I was like, walked into this place and was in heaven because they were doing everything that I thought was. Like, I thought I was going around the country, or like, our fellows were around the country, like, showing what was possible. It was amazing. We were changing minds, and it was, like, a whole different level. And then when I walked in there, I was like, oh, we suck. Like, this is the thing. So they had, like, several... That's why you can't travel to Europe. Yeah. Because it's, like, like, a future. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like, oh, I'm dumb American. Um, they had, like, 250 amazing developers, um, in this building, uh, but like again, like they're just like you know, DSM ended up being as part of the cabinet office, so in the center had power. Um, and we're taking down all of these really crappy websites, I mean, thousands of them across the British government, and you know, redoing them on this one simple, clear, um, lightweight platform, and just they had. Uh, it, was like the, the, it was like a giant startup space, for one thing, which you still often see. And they had this thing called the Wall of Dunn. So all over the whole office, the Wall of, the wall of Dunn. And you could literally just see, like, they, they basically had all websites and pieces of content. Like, most of the they just throw the content out. I and mean, a lot of government technology problems have nothing to do with technology. It's the, it's the way that government talks to the American people, or to, in this case, the British people. And so they, they were finding all the websites, some of them were just like throwing out. Like one of the jokes was like, it was a whole website about how like, if you were, um, if it was cold out, you should wear a sweater. <laughs> this is not, Good tip. not important information for the government to convey to citizens. Um, but the parts that were necessary to keep, they were um, rewriting in much clearer, simpler language, putting on this um, custom um, CMS that they had built. But, so you would just see people getting up from their, their chair and taking a piece of the old website and then go putting it on the wall of Dawn. And it was just like a flow of people. So just, you could see progress. It's amazing in the government, government digital service yeah. to be printing websites. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we took it. Oh, we printed it. Okay, fair. Yeah. We put it on the wall. But then you put the stuff on the wall of Dawn. I mean, they were just amazing. It was, it was so impressive to me. It was like, oh, it's not this thing at the edge. Because your, your point about like, the, the White House sort of suggesting things. That's what we were essentially doing. We were too pro America. We are showing what's possible and suggesting you do something different. Here in the UK, they were like, no, you will do it different. We will do it with you and for you, and then you're going to do it this way on your own. And so um, Todd, um, whom I knew a little bit through this Gov2O stuff, um, sent me this mail saying, like, I'm coming to California. I need you to clear your schedule and meet with me. And I'm like, well, I'm not there. And then Okay, but I'm glad that you're reaching out because I want you to see what I'm seeing. Like, this is amazing. Um, and it turns out he was recruiting me to come to the White House, which was very flattering. And I was like, I, 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 I love the PIF program, but I am, you know, reverse pitching you on we need an American version of the GDS. And that was, you know, there's a very long story in the middle. And the answer to your question was, was it difficult? Did it take a long time? It's yes. Um, but, you know, at the end of that, we did get the United States Digital Service, which is it's not exactly the same, but it's our version of GDS. So we've mentioned USDS and ATF, yeah. and can you explain, like, the models and how they're different and what, what those two things are? Um, yeah, and this is, 
at a very practical level. But as I said, I hope all of you will go work in one of these units or a similar one in state and local government one day. Um, USGS sits within the White House and um, was really designed as, as a unit that the, um, would work on presidential priorities. So, um, you know, part of that long story I was trying to skip over was that it was kind of going nowhere, even though I supposedly convinced them before I came in to do it. Um, and then healthcare.gov launched and had a very tough time. Um, I will remind you all that it did end up succeeding. It enrolled uh, 8 million people in its first um, open enrollment. But boy, did it suck for the beginning. And uh, it was really technically the first USDS project, even though we didn't have a, a unit of USDS yet. The people that we brought in to start to save healthcare.gov became the, the first people who, who, the first administrator um, of USDS was a healthcare.gov rescue leader. And if you don't recall or weren't around at yep. that time, like the healthcare.gov, the rise, fall, and rise of healthcare.gov was essentially like taking this big project of yep. enrolling assistance across the country into uh, unified like healthcare platforms. And as I recall, the, the spec of the software was split up amongst like 60 different companies. And along the way, most people thought it was not going to work. And then even like two weeks before when all the components are getting delivered, everyone's like, hey, this is not going to work. It's like, well, we got two weeks. Like, this is the date. And so then the date comes and you like turn the switch on. Turns out it doesn't work. And then... They demoed it to the president and it worked the one time they demoed it to the president. That's the reverse how the demos work. I <laughs> think Unfortunately, because then maybe they would have done something differently. Yeah, they used all their karma in that one moment, yeah. right? And so then after that, it was kind of like a superhero, like Avengers Assemble. Yeah. And it is, I mean, the way the legends are told is like this ragtag bunch of like 16 or 20 people or whatever, like, we'll fix everything. And then they show up and they hack codes for like two weeks, and then all of a sudden there's healthcare for everyone. That's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> they were ragtag. There's, there were more than, so there were, there were more, a little bit myth busting here. Should we, should we indulge? Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, there were. Come for the real truth, Jen. <laughs> um, there were more than sixteen or twenty of them, but not that much more that came in that we recruited to come in. Um, um, some of the people that were on the kind of um, the, we call it we called them the ad hoc team. They, they didn't have any power. Um, they were just the people that we brought in, and they had a lot of soft power. The people kind of knew who was on the ad hoc team. Some of the people on the ad hoc team were the people from the vendors that had a clue. And as Mikey Dickerson, who is one of these guys, and then became the first administrator of the United States Social Service, said, he were pe the people who still looked alive behind the eyes. <laughs> um, so we had, I mean, they were not exclusively outsiders. It was a combination of outsiders and insiders, and that's always true. Like whenever you hear a story about change in government and the narrative is that people came in from the outside and fixed it, there is another story there which involves people from the inside, and if they're not telling it, they're lying. So, um, but yeah, there were a bunch of them, and um, they didn't write really write code. What they did is they stood in endless endless stand-ups and resolved communication problems between the vendors. They did write some, so the, I, let me take back. What Mikey did is um, ran like a kind of endless stand-up, essentially, um, where you would find out that like, um, this, you know, this, and I would, you know, I was in some of these meetings, like, so, so and so would be over here, and they'd be like, you, you were supposed to do this thing, did you do it? Like, yeah, I put the ticket in, and, they, and they'd be like, well, the you know, well, did you get the ticket? No, I didn't get the ticket. What system did you put the ticket in? Oh, that system. Oh, yeah, I'm using a different ticketing system. Like, stuff like that over and over again. It was the most boring, awful, thankless job you could possibly imagine. I'm thankful. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then there was a smaller team. Um, so they were just like, we have to resolve. They basically debugged at a massive scale about, and they worked 20 hour days for 100 days straight debugging the site, and they almost like all died from exhaustion. There was an, and I'm not kidding, I felt awful that I couldn't really help them that much, and they were, 
they were just like, if we don't do this, like people are going to not have health insurance and they're going to die. And they really, you know, was, they really felt that degree of mission around it. And so they were just not. No gonna pressure. Say, no pressure. I used to say, like the Todd part is to say, um, Todd believes that if he sleeps, people will die. And unfortunately, this was true in his case. Um, but there was another team that Gene Kim ran that just, they were like, you guys are going to fix the existing site. And there were, I think this team was like 12 people just rewrote the whole, uh, not the whole site. They rewrote um, like the login system. Uh, like they rewrote key pieces of the site, the 13 of them in like 13 weeks. So that they turned that they were about done, they actually could replace one entire module. I hope they printed it out. They <laughs> <laughs> printed a lot of things out. That's I computers. I didn't answer the answer to your question, I don't remember what it was now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, it's super interesting, I think, to look at that moment in time, mm -hmm. right, where there was so much hope and investment yeah. in what was happening. Yeah. And those people that came in from the Googles and Facebooks and Apples and whatever of the yeah. world, it, it, I didn't get the impression that it was with judgment. It was like, this is our people, these are things we care about, like we're coming in to do, this This is like life and death, but not, it's like they were coming in because they were joining the team, not trying to like replace the team. And, yeah. It's interesting, yesterday, something came up in, in talks like, kind of more than once, right, is the reason these projects fail is not because you picked Python instead of Java or this front-end library instead of that one, it's because you were using different ticketing systems. Right. So you didn't agree about how the API was going to line up from one service to another, and it's like, it's the people problems, the people problems, the people problems over and over. Over and over and over again, like, I mean, there were, I mean, this, this particular project had had an issue, other issues like the fact that um, they had bought some load balancing systems and they bought and installed all of them like, at once. Yeah. So there were some other like technical issues, but no, I mean across the board, I think when you see um, when you see these mega software projects, it's it's communication. It's communication. We were. I had originally asked you about like the difference between yes. TNF and USDS. Okay, so. What, and I got sidetracked on healthcare.gov, but um, USDS basically has the ability to go into a federal agency and say, hi, we're here to help, whether invited or not. And they take great pride in saying um, that while they're probably sent um, by the White House, they really like to show up in a way that's like not intrusive. Like they want to feel like they're there to help, not to sort of boss people around. Um, but um, but yes, when they be, when you know when we are not delivering benefits to veterans, um, it doesn't matter whether the team at the VA wants them; they will be sent in, right? Um, uh, and they work um, kind of more on um, like like they come in to kind of help stabilize and change the directory or something, but they're not probably going to stay on it super, super long term. That's not true at all. That's not true of every project. Um, there's a guy who lives here named Kelly Taylor. You know him? He oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Kelly has been working on stuff with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services through USDS for a long time. He's on much longer term projects. Um, but the 18F, which sits in the General Services Administration, which, by the way, um, 18F developers, most of those jobs are completely um, uh, geography independent, so you can work from here and do them. Um, Kelly is a unique person where most of the USDS projects are actually based in DC. But um, they are more like an internal agency to uh, other federal agencies. So, <laughs> yeah, so um, USDA will hire them to do a project um, and they'll do everything from like actually writing software, like they rewrote the federal election. Commission sites so that make all the data much more uh, you know open and transparent and the site much more readable. So it's like an actual you know big project they just did. Um, but they'll also do stuff like uh, procurement consulting. Um, we brought them in to work on the child welfare program in, in California. Was like, look, you have a six hundred million dollar monolithic um, seven year project. It's not going to work. Let's help you rewrite the procurement and, and um, the RFP. 
for greater success will now actually come in and help you write that, help agencies write that. So basically you hire them, whereas um, you know, at USDS, they will just show up. <laughs> and yeah, so it almost feels to me like USDS, they're like special forces yeah. in a way. Like yeah. they drop in, they kind of like, we're working together, also we're going to push you around a little bit, we're going to get this thing going and then we're out. Yeah. And 18F is a little bit more like really friendly mercenaries where you're like, hey, here's a problem, it's a money, yeah. and then they solve it. For yeah, I mean, and USDS has money appropriated from Congress that they can spend how they want, whereas GSA is supposed to be like, we're here, you give us money from your agency, and that's how we get paid back. The GSA, if you're not familiar with, like, I hope you're not familiar with federal agencies and stuff, they are like a grab bag of the federal government. Like, the ones, they're the ones who, like, pay people to cut the lawns at federal buildings, and also they pay people to build software. Yeah, they, they, they run an enormous real estate operation. Enormous. Including mowing lawns. <laughs> That's a lot of lawns in them. Uh, 2016, uh, some things, there was like this election, and it wasn't a really great day for a lot of people. Uh, my character is it's like cold water in the face of a lot of these people who had signed up. And, and to be clear, with yeah. things like 18F and USDS, and um, I think very uh, ethically aligned with like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau yeah. was born during the same time, and all these things. People were really, there was a lot of momentum and energy around the idea of like, let's get into government and let's make it into like the thing that we want for the next century. And then on, on yeah. that dark day, I think it was kind of uh, yeah, cold water in the face to all these people. Yeah. How has the movement changed since then? It's been interesting. Um, I think there were a lot of breaks um, where people felt very differently about things, and um, it was hard. It was very hard because um, on the one hand, um, there was an enormous fear that a work that USDS and 18F had already done um, was going to be in the hands of somebody that they thought would not have doesn't have the same values and could use it for evil. Um, and for example, um, USDS had done it, recently done a project to speed the um, process of bringing in refugees. And I mean, to be fair, I think. Having more refugees come into our country, to uh, my values is sort of an unqualified they're good, and I'm really, really glad they did it. But they were sort of worried that now um, the federal government had access to all this information about these refugees. Um, there's a bunch of ways in which streamlining access to information, of course, if you think that information is going to be used against those people, makes you very nervous. Um, uh, so, a bunch of people. Um, I don't know, I'm not going to name it. So certain folks just like, you got to get out, like, get out. And a lot of the people were like, right, veterans still need benefits. Um, students still have crushing student loan debt and need to, um, uh, you know, refinance it. Um, he's, we still have, you know, terrible foster care systems around the country. Um, we still, like, uh, how can I go? By the way, they still have them here, like every year. Like it's gonna crash again. Like it's it's still sort of being recovered every year. Like none of these problems for actual real people in America went away. And walking away from whether it was the White House or local government or any of these things is super not gonna help it. Um, I really understood. My, my view was sort of on both sides, but I came down on the side of stay because government is what we make it, not who is in charge. And yes, you might have to leave if there's a clear breach of your values and you're asked to do something that you don't believe in. But up until that point, stay and express your values and fight for good and write software. And hey, if necessary, you know, we, we, if you're asked to do something um, that you don't believe in, I was like, it's this really easy answer to that. Thank you. We will work on that. The procurement will take six years. <laughs> so I think it was so I mean, it, it was it's been really hard. I think a lot of people have sort of, you know, um they're they're I have very good friends of mine did not talk to each other for a year after that when they each made different choices. It was really hard to see, but um 
uh, overall, I mean, I'll tell you, like a very, very dear friend of mine, you know, was was destroyed and, and left USDS and actually came to work with us for a while. And then, you know, a year and a half in, she got recruited to be the uh, chief tech, uh, the staff technologist or chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission, where she's going to get to have, you know, be a smart tech person in the room as we figure out how to regulate the technology platforms. Um, privacy turns out to be quite an issue, and they just don't have enough people to really understand how this works to make smart decisions about this regulation. And she's like, well, I'm going back in. I was like, good, go in. This is important. They're going to make the wrong decision if you're not in the room. And then I started teasing her, have fun working for Trump. <laughs> but, you know, she knew, she knew how I meant it, which is, this is important stuff. Yeah, it's now, it's almost like now more than ever, in a way, right? Where That's how I think about it. Like the pressure, uh, you're almost going into like an active war zone situation, right? It's like, you can, you can still be the defender of your ideals in day-to-day -day decision making in the way you can influence policy and so forth. Yeah. And the truth is, I think a lot of people aren't finding that that's the case. I think they're finding on a day-to-day -day basis that mostly they're still able to do what they wanted to do. They're still able to help veterans. They're still able to, uh, like Kelly Taylor, you should come talk here next year. Still able to help get people their own access, access to their own health data. In fact, just as much, maybe a little bit more, than in the past administration. Because it's just not that simple. As the, the model of like having technical people involved in government proves out, I think it, it's maybe it easy or accessible to recruit people to work on um, the foster care system, to work yeah. on child welfare, to work on healthcare access and all that. And eventually, we're going to get to like, ICE really wants to bring in ATF, right? Or yeah. uh, DOD has like started to, to imitate some programs, and people have degrees of discomfort with like, well, I wanted to do government stuff, but not that kind of government stuff. What like, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean for like the future of this community? Is that uh, just the reality of like, again, like let's get into these things and try and do them and like ethical, smart ways. You yeah. wrote a blog post um, that your quote said, like, having poor tools doesn't make us fight less, it makes us fight badly. Yeah. Right? And so can you talk about, like, that perspective? Yeah, but then you may have to get, you know, you may have to shoot me out of here later. But I, this may offend some people. I don't know. We'll see. Um, it's just tough stuff. It's really, really tough stuff. First of all, I've you know, I will say, um, USDS and ETF get a lot of attention. Most of what you really want to work on actually happens at the state level. Um, uh, there's a group here in in Colorado that's trying to get the Colorado Digital Service to be a thing. Y'all should support them. Um, that and you know, Medicaid, SNAP, uh, which is food stamps, child welfare, DMV, like all of the big, big things. The states too. I don't think there's much to do with it. I and mean, they do, they regulate it, and we end up working with the federal regulators a lot. But states are kind of, states and cities are kind of where it's at. So just want to make that plug before we go back to our gnarly examples, um, the 30 examples. Um, so, first of all, I will just say, like, it's just not going to happen that you, like, go to work for the federal government and suddenly you're working for ICE. Like, you would know, like, you would have an opportunity. If it were through USDS, they're just not going to make you work on it. They're going to find people, they, they'll, they'll have reasonable conversations with you about, like, who's, you know, for whom is this something that you think can be in line with your ethics? And they're going to talk about it as an organization. They talk about what's in line with their organizational ethics as separate, frankly, from just government at large. They, you, you have that control and you have that ability. Um, let me take the um, ICE example for a second, and this is this is where I, I, I'm gonna, you know, I'll speak on slightly thin ice, so to speak. Um, as a parent, what happened at the border um, made me cry many days in a row. It's just so unacceptable what we were doing there, um, and frankly, what we're kind of still doing. And, and, and here's the thing: um, I, I wrote a post on Vox about this. Um, 
but when you, when you really look at what's happening there, um, actually having decent programmers within the Customs and Border Patrol probably would have saved us when we changed course, and I say we in the broader sense, um, initially there was a policy that required families and kids to separate. The problem is that when we reversed that policy, we couldn't change the software, and we had lost the connections between the A number of the kid and the A number of the parent. And that's why we couldn't reunify these kids. So having some decent programmers there, or frankly even somebody who just thought to make one giant spreadsheet of these things, and I'm sure there are other nuances to Every it. Every program comes back to spreadsheets. It's always yeah. spreadsheets all the way down. Just somebody with some creative solutions, or just somebody be like, I, like <laughs> it could not have been that hard to do a better job of tracking the relationship between the two A numbers. Um, but nobody was there to do it. And so I just got an email from Viv Grobar yesterday, because we've been tracking this with her. She was working on this through uh, New America recently. We still have 497 parents and kids who are separated because we can't put their A numbers back together. So you may, as I did, grossly disagree with the policy that separated them. But if you're not willing to be there and help with the IT problems with the reunification, you also have blood on your hands, in my opinion. Oh, I feel like they want to go home now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Change the topic. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into my, my last little thread here. <laughs> so I'm a software developer, and I'm not. <laughs> hypothetically, I clearly do look at my GitHub. I'm no longer there. Uh, but uh, just kidding, it's still school, most of you. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
It also doesn't pay as badly as you think it does. <laughs> uh, we have some open positions at Code for America. We used to do the fellowship. The fellowship is still part of what we do, but we have 70 full-time people who get paid you know, what we consider sort of market rate. Um, we actually benchmark ourselves against startups. We don't have that nice um, uh, stock option package for you. The nonprofit <laughs> stock option. The nonprofit stock option doesn't, doesn't work out too good. Is how great you're going to feel. Yeah. <laughs> so that um, equity, hard equity. Hard equity. Do we pay what, you know, we pay what is required to live in expensive city like San Francisco, or we have people in Atlanta, we have people in Chicago. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, and the ATF stuff too, it doesn't pay that badly. It's just, if you're, if you're, yes, if you're, if you went into software because you want to be Mark Zuckerberg rich, don't go into government. But you can like raise kids and have a family and like have a nice apartment and stuff on um, what you make in, in government, you know. Like, uh, but I, I, but your, you know, your point about, um, it's like the meeting and your job. The one thing I would say is like, Go get jobs in the very best places that you can. I mean, I know you're not all right out, but what, if, you're, if you are earlier in your career as a software developer, my advice would be to choose the place where you are going to get the absolute best training in, in you know, and have the best PMs and the best um, engineering managers. Because what you need when you, you will not have that when you go into government. And you have to be the person who recreates all those fantastic practices. Your actual coding skills are going to be taken for granted. And as you said, it's not like, it's not going to live or die by, you know, Python or Rails. It's, it's going to be that there isn't the infrastructure, um, that you're judged on different things. There's, you know... Actually, product managers, in fact, don't really exist in government yet. And that makes it really hard to write software. So you have to go in there and fight for the environment that creates great software. So know what that environment looks like when you get into government and fight like hell to create that space for yourself and the other people who are going to come in. That is incredible change making. I think we'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks for your time, Jack. Thank you.